Welcome to Executives at the Edge, a podcast brought to you by MEF. I'm your host, Pascal Menezes. Join me as we explore thought-provoking perspectives from the leaders and change makers who are propelling enterprise digital transformation forward. Welcome to this special PowerPlay episode of MEF's Executives at the Edge podcast. This recap explores how Network as a Service is redefining connectivity. From cloud-inspired flexibility to automation and tailored campus land solutions, industry analysts Steve Thomas, Roy Chua, and Sean Morgan discuss how NAS is evolving to meet diverse enterprise needs. I like to start off with the definition I used, I, I called it more of a modern business model for service providers to quote, sell managed network services to enterprises and their wholesale providers. Uh, this enables network operators to deliver a cloud-like consumption model with a frictionless customer experience. And that was kind of my definition of trying to get NAS to a simple uh, effort. Um, but what I really learned was NAS means things to different providers. And uh, if you're a, a, no, um, a data center provider, NAS pretty much means, you know, provisioning level to Ethernet services across the data, their data center footprint. You know, if you're talking to an equipment provider, um, which are actually software providers these days, it's it's hard not. Uh, the o- OEMs is the old name for them, but um, they're really you know softwares, and they're they're looking to position to sell their licenses as much as possible through the network operator, and so they're creating their software to be incorporated into this consumption model as well. And they were the first ones to have subscriptions anyway. And, you know, so it's kind of forcing the network operator to also evolve into subscriptions too, if that's what the um, equipment providers are doing. And then the network oper- and then you have the, the underlying OSS and BSS providers that are also um, operation systems and services, as well as the, the business systems which OSS and BSS means. They're also uh, working to enable that middleware. They've always been the software middleware between the the provision, the clients or end customers, companies, and the telecom operator themselves. They kind of help them uh, operate more efficiently through the use of software to, to, you know, enable building networks at large scale. And so and then you have the, the obviously the network operators, which is what MEF works with. And so that whole ecosystem is pretty rich. And so when I, I my the goal of the paper was to kind of give everyone a little bit of, of visibility and uh, and highlight uh, what it, NAS really meant to each one of those players. Automation is key. Uh, I actually said uh, the AA should stand for automation, automation in NAS because it's that's uh, so much focus on the automation. Um, the OEM providers themselves are, uh, you know, all of them are trying to position their services as zero touch provisioning. So it's um, they're making their the devices and the deployment of of, of licenses on you know white box um, servers and and, and CPE equipment. Uh, you know, easy enough to the, the the provider, you know, doesn't necessarily always have to roll a truck, you know, and so that helps them out. Um, but it also allows them to to apply uh, policies and 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 you know um, various network and security policies at at a faster rate to keep up with the changing landscape. And so the automation is needed because the networks of today are are need to be more flexible and adaptive and uh, allowing a platform that is really more software based um, is kind of the foundation of network as a service and that's where the um, automation uh, there's tons of automation in there so it's you know all the way from you know quoting billing and and provisioning um, to providing um, prescriptive you know feedback on what what next steps you might want to do with your network uh, in terms of artif- even artificial intelligence uh, in the background. So automation covers um, 
quite a few different areas uh, in this network as a service model. So NAS itself, um, I think much of the network operators portfolio now will be as a service. So as they grow and expand their portfolios or even reduce their portfolios, to make it more simple, right? Um, the it'll be more as a service. And so that's that's one thing that I picked up. And then the other thing too is the dynamic bandwidth, that was really what NAS meant early on. Yeah. It's not what it means now. Now it means, yes, you have all these um, software-defined uh, networking, um, SASE, SSE components, uh, two things that you can add on. And um, what I think really enables that is the disaggregation of you know, the software and the hardware. And so that's something that even when the dynamic bandwidth was allocated, you know, pretty much the OS was still on the, uh, the router itself, the router or switch. NAS is a little hard to define in the sense that we, what we see out there is a, a lot of different definitions from on-demand, you know, WAN or wide area services to cloud-based networking and also manage campus Wi-Fi and LAN is NAS. And in some cases, we're seeing on-demand SD-WAN and SASE services being called as NAS. And the mobile carriers with the 5G networks are also terming their end-to-end -end, you know, network service slicing as NAS. And so there's a lot of variety of NAS. From our perspective, I think we look at NAS, I think sort of as a parallel to SaaS, software as a service. Um, and it's, it's more around sort of a, a business model and a consumption model. And that is characterized generally by things like short-term commitments, the on-demand or short-term contracts, uh, rapid provisioning, so the on-demand provisioning or very quick provisioning. And the question as to why NAS and why now, I think uh, you're absolutely right. I think the cloud sort of led the way. Enterprises saw the advantage of the cloud. And there is a strong desire in our talk, you know, in our work with enterprises and our conversations with them. They're fed up with the complexity and this perceived nickel and diming from the different providers in terms of, you know, they don't want to deal with hardware and software and maintenance and support. And because of that um, experience or positive experience with cloud, with SaaS, with IaaS, with PaaS, right? They're looking for the same thing on the networking side. It's like, if I can get it for computing storage, why can't I get that for, for networking? I think that's one element. The second element is the evolution of the business preferences. Um, a lot of businesses are looking for more of an OPEX model as opposed to a CAPEX heavy model. And so they prefer the scale as you grow model, you know, sort of, you know, uh, you don't have to risk a lot of capital upfront. They're looking for a pay as you go, pay as you grow, and an outcome based type solution. And NAS happens to apply and align with that. I think the third element is yes, we've talked about NAS for, for many years. I think the mindset's ready. The other element is from the supply side, not just the demand side, but the automation capabilities. Um, the SDN has actually taken hold, the programmability aspect. I think now the stacks for networking are a lot more programmable, a lot more flexible than they used to be. Um, I think carriers and those providing the network services are getting better at flexible charging. I mean, not all the way there yet, as we know, and coordination and orchestration. And I know the MEF has a big role to play on that side as well. And I think that sort of supply um, side evolution and innovation coupled with the changing mindset, culture, the you know, demands influenced by cloud consumption, I think that's sort of driving that why NAS and why now. Yeah, so you are right that there is a lot of confusion in the market. And you're absolutely right that reskilling, upskilling is absolutely critical uh, to to maintaining sort of the, for an IT person, upskilling, reskilling continues, it never stops, and it's important. I think the role that MEF has played historically in terms of putting the framework together, providing understanding of the different interface points, the ecosystem, the architecture and the structure, I think that's very helpful. Um, I think having a starting point is always a good thing. And having someone's starting point who actually has been doing this for some time is definitely very helpful to the enterprise IT folks or even the carrier IT folks and you know, um, networking ex uh, professionals out there. So I think that's absolutely a value to the organize to the ecosystem. And so I think, generally speaking, it is changing. 
it is getting more complex. I don't think things will get less complex. Um, and the the scope of what's needed to be in an effective IT or networking person will continue to grow. I think that's going to be the reality. And resources, like what the MEF is providing, um, and uh, I think that's that's helpful. And again, you know, from a credentialing standpoint, I know that employers um, like that. I know that in many cases, networking experts sometimes view that as a way to improve their hireability or their sort of career mobility. I think those will continue to add value that way. And I applaud the MEF for, for sort of pushing and recognizing the NAS wave as, as it were and trying to get ahead of it and, and trying to help the overall ecosystem um, educate them and get ahead of that and coordinate efforts between the carriers and enterprise uh, IT vendors as well. Yeah, it's a really confusing market. I, I know that uh, MEP has mentioned this before, said how you know it's confusing and we don't. There's a variability in how people are defining the different terms. It can mean so many different things. Most people, when they hear the term NAS, they think of wide area networking, uh, like transport routing, or a, as a cloud inspired service. But there's a whole new dimension of NAS out there now. That's NAS for campus land services. So one similarity that Campus NAS has to NAS is that it's inspired by the cloud model, uh, which as we know, involves some kind of technology abstraction, uh, like elasticity and automation. Uh, but many of the characteristics of a cloud computing model are based on uh, an implementation in which infrastructure is centralized and shared. And of course, in the campus, there are laws of physics, which we just can't avoid, right? So cables have maximum lengths and RF signals have propagation characteristics. Um, and so there's a lot of the technology that needs to be on site and dedicated to the customer. And so this means that vendors, when they're, they're, when they're delivering their campus NAS offers, they're coming up with different creative ways to deliver land services in a cloud inspired model. So they're not all taking the same approach, but uh, they're innovating in, in, in different ways. We've identified like three key characteristics of the campus NAS uh, offers today, and not all of them exhibit all three, but, but they, they largely cut across many of the offers. So th the first one is that the hardware costs are charged in a recurring price model. So instead of this big upfront purchase of equipment, uh, it involves uh, recurring charges, which implies some kind of behind the scenes financing for the equipment. The second is, and, and this is one of the things to your point, which is very important, is that at least some of the network lifecycle services are delivered by the vendor or and and or the MSP. And these are bundled with the recurring charges as well. So here I'm speaking of network lifecycle services and not like 24 by seven TAC or equipment support, but really network lifecycle. And then the third characteristic of many of the offers on the, on the market are that they're priced in an outcome basis. So this implies like some level of technology abstraction. So instead of purchasing like a, a node B or a Wi-Fi AP or a, a switch port, um, enterprises could purchase a number of devices that are supported or coverage across a specific area. And so purchasing a, like LAN on an outcome basis is effectively transferring the risk of delivering the quality of service to the vendor. There's not this de a single definition of what Campus NAS is. Uh, and so what we've seen on the market is they're really grouped around three different types of service. And each of those types of service are targeted at different types of enterprises. So the first uh, service we call enabler campus NAS, which is really designed to make it easier or less costly for an MSP to wrap its lifecycle services around vendor hardware in a CNAS construct. So uh, this would allow, this allows MSPs to reach maybe further down market, you know, at the lower end of the mid market, uh, to reach a larger volume of enterprises um, and really has the potential to grow the outsourcing of lifecycle services. There's another type of campus NAS, which we're calling turnkey campus NAS. So these are bespoke offers targeted at very large corporations that bundle a complex suite of IT needs into a scope of work. So that's, that's targeting a different segment. And then there's a third uh, group that we call LAN as a utility campus NAS. Uh, these, this service is really an outcome-based service. 
vendors are uh, innovating on a technology level as much as they can to integrate automation into the network management. And this service is really suited to be an underlay to innovative applications that they could layer on top. So it could be like you could think of uh, retail services like e-labeling services or um, occupancy monitoring in a carpeted office environment. So services like that that could be layered on top of a LAN as a utility service. Um, and so these th that that segment is going to tend to be better suited to the mid market uh, with more standard um, floor plans and also smaller IT departments. So it's just that sweet spot between having complex IT needs but not really having a full IT department to deliver uh, you know the quality they need. Thanks for joining us for Executives at the Edge. Don't miss an episode. Subscribe today. Share online a review. Find all our episodes on your favorite podcast platform and at left.net.